Yes, yes, yes. Okay, well, thank you, first of all, for the kind words. I mean, um, you said, you know, uh, Dr. Laffer said that uh, after his introduction that um, his father would have enjoyed it and his mother would have believed it. My mother is more skeptical because once when I was an occasion like this where I was given a very generous introduction that you gave me, uh, my mother uh, turned to the person and said, yes, I, next and said, it's very sad. John just can't seem to hold down a job. <laughs> Now, now I, I want to begin by just saying something about that marvellous lecture we just heard. You know, I've edited um, six magazines in all and several op-ed and editorial pages. And I have one, one of my conclusions after that is, I always say, um, does this guy crack a lot of jokes? And if the answer is yes... I say, in that case, he really knows what he's talking about because people can only crack good, effective jokes on topics that they really deeply understand. And I think that having listened today uh, to Dr. Laffer, I came, away, I laughed and chortled all the way through, but at the end, I've come away with a much clearer understanding of the economics of the last 20 or 30 years, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Now, um, I also should say, by the way, you don't know this, but we are neighbors, uh, because I married a girl from um, uh, Alabama, just down the road in, in um, Huntsville. And I know the real reason why you moved to, uh, to um, uh, to, to Nashville, namely that exactly halfway between Nashville and Huntsville, there is the Jack Daniels Distillery. <laughs> and uh, by the way, I advise you to go there. It's a marvelous experience and you can buy a bottle of the stuff and so on and so forth. But you can't drink it because it's in a dry county. <laughs> but you can take it home to Nashville. <laughs> Now, uh, I very much uh, enjoyed uh, those remarks. I want to say just, just uh, the, the, the question, I want to say a couple of things and then I'll answer the question directly. The first is, if you want to know what happened in the 1980s, it's very simple. You went to, if you went to London in the 70s, and this is the, the point, of course, that Dr. Laffer made about what happened before. If you went to London in the 70s, um, you would go into a capital in which the um, tax rate on investment income was 98%. And somebody said, uh, think to Milton Friedman, you know, if they're hit that badly, how come I see so many Rolls Royces? And Friedman said, well, it's very simple, really. If you're paying 98% on investment income, owning a Rolls Royce is a very good investment because you can drive it around for six or seven years and then you can sell it for a great deal more than you bought it. And of course, that's not being taxed at 98%. And you've had the benefit of a Rolls Royce for the previous six or eight years. Now, when Mrs. Thatcher came in, it, cutting taxes sharply wasn't the first thing she did. She had to take on the Russians. She had to deal with a, uh, with a phenomenally high inflation rate, which she brought down. And the philosophy of Thatcherism, by the way, is establish a framework of stability in economics, in fiscal matters, in financial matters. Remove obstacles to growth in the form of excessive regulation, and then leave it to the people, to the entrepreneurs, to the businesses, to the workers, to actually get on with the job of making and selling. And that's what she did. And that's what Reagan did. And at the end of that period of time, we had the longest boom since the Second World War. And that created an enormous number of jobs, especially, by the way, for left-wing economists, because they, they had to find increasingly ingenious ways of explaining why the boom had nothing whatever to do with the policies of Reagan and Thatcher. Uh, and, and they were very ingenious about it, but at the end of the day, they couldn't do it. Um, the second thing I want to take away is this. Is, is this. Um, the, 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 the reason uh, that Dr. Laffer moved to Nashville, as he said, was, was for, for tax reasons. And indeed, uh, the fact is that in, you, in, in, in um, a federal system, uh, the states have to compete against one another uh, for, the, for the workers, for the investors, uh, for the businesses. And if they don't do a good job of competition, those people vote with their feet and go elsewhere. So that 
keeps government under some kind of control. You can't, a government can't get too far out of line or else it loses simply too many people. Exactly the same thing is true with free trade between different states in an international system. In both cases, you have, I think, what the legal experts called jurisdictional competition. And jurisdictional competition is a way, again, of keeping control of government, making sure it doesn't get too large. Um, uh, it, it, that's one of the reasons why Mrs. Thatcher became increasingly skeptical and indeed hostile about the European Union. Because what had originally begun as a market of governments in which people might go from A to B through free trade, keeping government disciplined, increasingly through um, harmonization of regulations, was becoming a cartel of governments. And that has continued to the present day. And that's why she was so strongly of the view that if the European Union wasn't reformed, uh, then the British would have to reconsider it. And the third is this, and this relates directly to your work. In 1961, the um, English version of the IPA, the Institute of Economic Affairs, um, which had only been founded, I think, four years before, held a meeting of those conservative MPs who were distressed with the anti-market trend of the Macmillan government. They got all of them in a room. I think there were 12. Uh, <laughs> And, and they were all in despair. This was the time in which Macmillan, had, who was a socialist basically, uh, had gone over the top, introduced income uh, control, um, indicative economic planning, and all of these things, Neddy and Nicky, for those who remember the period. And they were all gloomy, nothing could be done about it. And it, and it went on and on like this, and Ralph Harris and Arthur Seldon were sort of the, in despair themselves listening to these people. When one of the MPs there said, this is absurd. You are all in politics, and if you can't persuade the voter that they get a better deal from Marks and Spencers than they get from the post office or the co-op, you should go into a different profession. Now that was Margaret Thatcher. And um, Mrs. Thatcher's um, progress from that point to the point which we, where we now rightly hold her in a kind of reverence, um, it wasn't absolutely steady. She wavered a bit from time to time, but it was cumulatively absolutely on the right side. However, the, the truth of the matter was that all of the, all of the great truths that we've just heard now, they would have counted for nothing if people hadn't prepared the ground, if they hadn't argued the case, if they hadn't, if Mrs. Thatcher, Keith Joseph, uh, Jeffrey Howe and the rest, uh, uh, and a new advisor at some point, Brian Redding and others, if they hadn't gone out and spent all of the years of opposition converting people to the essential truths of free market classical liberalism. But they did that, and when everything collapsed in Britain in the winter of discontent, the reason why they got elected was because they had already prepared the ground. And people seeing the collapse of social democracy said, well, is there something else? My gosh, goodness, yes, it is, it's there. Now, now what does, where does this relate to outsiderdom? Because it is important. Well, the answer is this, and, and I can speak here for Mrs. Thatcher. I leave it uh, to Professor Laffer to talk about Ronald Reagan. Margaret Thatcher was a product of provincial Methodist England. She grew up in the 1920s and 30s, the daughter of a grocer. Um, she, uh, he, he, she was well educated. Um, but she had a fairly, they had a fairly hard life in those days, uh, and she knew it. And for her, it was a, a, it was a life of work and effort and scholarship and study. Um, um, she did not believe that life um, was going to be rewarding unless you put a lot of effort into it. Now, they were the virtues of that England. They were not the virtues of the metropolitan England, which she found herself in from essentially from 1955 onwards, really from the date of her uh, marriage to, uh, to, um, to Dennis. R read all, all, the, the, all of the recent uh, 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 biographies are terrific. Uh, do read them, they're very, very solid. But effectively, she found herself the person who believed in private and at a deep level what the political leaders around her, Churchill being an exception, 
did not really believe, but would talk about from a public platform. So she really believed in the case for free enterprise. Um, other people essentially would talk about it, but when they got in, they would act on a totally different set of assumptions. And that's why, um, uh, and she was true to those virtues and values. She was true to the things she believed in. And then she found out that the more she spoke out about these things on a public platform, the more she acted in, that, in, in line with them in government, the more other people came around to her. So that, in a way, you all have this experience. You think you're the only person in the world who believes something, and then somebody else stands up and expresses your point of view, and you rally to them, and so do five or six other people around the table or around the room. And that was her great, um, her great virtue. Uh, she didn't understand economics as well as Professor Laffer. She, um, but she was prepared, once she had grasped the essential points, to work hard at both putting them across and being brave in not giving way when she met opposition. And I don't think that, by the way, I think those are virtues, even if intellectually you're, you, you're not up to snuff. But she was up to snuff as well. And, and, and we owe an enormous amount to her courage, uh, to her fundamentally sound outlook, and to her upbringing. And, uh, and outside of them is, in, in her case, and in Reagan's, I think, uh, tr it's, it, it's important to remember that the outside, the outside from which they came was one grounded in correct political principles. Uh, I, we'll go on to discuss what they are. John, we are so thrilled that now that you're in Australia, we will be able to carry on this, this conversation. Uh, we've got time for two or three questions. I might just ask um, uh, Dr Laffer one, one question to begin with. Uh, the other day you gave a wonderful interview to the Australian Financial Review where you said you're not Australian, um, but you do have a view on uh, the current government's deficit tax. Now, the, the current government has not only introduced a deficit tax, uh, it's also introduced a number of other taxes and it's also done things like uh, dramatically increase uh, the excise on, on tobacco that you, you mentioned earlier. Um, what are those tax increases going to do to government revenue according to the Laffer curve? Oh my God. <laughs> First place... Uh, How do I do that? It's on. Oh, first place, uh, they misquoted me. Uh, I didn't make a comment about Australia, but I mean, you know, 50%, 52%, what's that, your marginal tax rate? That's pretty high. Uh, you know, if you look at it, uh, you can get it a lot lower than that. If you had a broad-based flat tax, you could get it way lower. I did Jerry Brown's flat tax and when he ran for president in the US and we were able to get a 12% tax on uh, uh, net sales and a 12% tax on personal unadjusted gross income to replace all federal taxes with no Laffer curve effect, no static revenue at full employment. So a 12% tax would be enough on both of those. On cigarette taxes, which I've just finished the book, which I mentioned, I mean, you find all these governments trying to stop cigarettes and raising taxes. They find that, number one, they don't stop the smoking. Number two, they lead to smuggling. And if you look at Ireland, what happened with the smuggling, their revenues dropped dramatically. The cigarettes were smuggled in. They were produced uh, illicitly. Uh, the tobacco was a lot worse. But, I mean. So, you know, the, the examples here on tobacco taxation are fascinating. I mean, I, I think it was in Sweden they had the, the cigarette tax, uh, which each cigarette got a, a, a given tax, so people made five-foot cigarettes that you cut. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, just, it's just beautiful the way markets work. They have a, they have a party cigar in, in Sweden, I think. <laughs> that was Poland. Party cigar in Sweden. They have tobacco. Smoking tobacco is, uh, on cigarettes is taxed at a very high rate, but cigar tobacco, because it's not bad, there's really low rates, so they put uh, cigarette tobacco <laughs> in cigars. You unwrap it, roll it up. And, I mean, you know, people are really ingenious. And, and what you got to do is be able to treat these things seriously to achieve your objectives. I mean, there's nothing wrong with taxing. In fact, there's something really wonderful with taxing cigarettes to reduce their usage. I mean, tobacco is very harmful, and we've got to reduce it, but when you make it go illicit, like uh, you know, like heroin, heroin or marijuana or stuff, you lose all contact with the consumers and stuff, so you really want to maintain your control 
of the tobacco industry. And I think you really want to do it through correct taxation, making sure it works, and making sure you educate people not to smoke. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a very, very damaging one. And when you look at these governments going on right now, and I didn't discuss this in the book, but if you look at the governments right now wanting to tax e-cigarettes at the same rate that they tax tobacco burning or these reduced risk tax, you know, these things don't have the carcinogens in them at all. What you want to do is if you can get people from switching from cigarettes to, to, to e-cigarettes or to these reduced risk products, you're going to save lots and lots of lives. Why would you tax them both the same? Well, that's what I do in the book. I go through all this stuff. But it, tobacco is a fascinating topic. I mean, it, it's a disgusting little habit. But the taxation and the examples, it's just unbelievably fascinating how governments lose control of what they're really trying to do, which is educate the public not to smoke and tax people so they get an incentive not to smoke. And that's a very good objective. But you've got to use clear thinking. You've got to use data-based analysis to get to those results. We've got time for three questions. Oh, so, so down here, James Guest. Uh, thank you. I said to John uh, a question without uh, on notice, um, and I really would be very interested to know, Dr. Laffer, whether you're, you acknowledge a debt to that famous a well, once famous Dutch economist who wrote in 1889 in Dutch uh, on progressive taxation. And his name, of course, that great old Dutch name, Arnold Jacob Cohen Stewart. Um, so uh, I wonder whether, uh, uh, if you would care to say something about that, I'd be pleased. But now I really, really would like an explanation of why that uh, stimulus package was wrong. Now, I think most of us probably thought all the stimulus packages had a lot of wrong, uh, wrong things in their detail and the way they were carried out. But, and I've heard from some of the local Austrians about the Ricardian equivalence that I, I think it is. Because they were financed out of debt, it meant that businesses, of course, would then pull back because they were going to have to pay more tax later, later like hell they were. But anyway, that was the, the Austrian theory I understood. But my theory, my understanding was simply that what you want to do is get people, all the people who have some credit or cash, to start spending their money, which requires confidence. Now, whatever will produce the confidence will do it, surely. It could be a mafia don who's got discovered to have... I'll, I'll take that as a question, James. <laughs> What was the question? So the question, the question is, question. Uh, why, uh, uh, what's really wrong with the, with the, uh, with the uh, stimulus package if it creates confidence? Uh, what's really wrong with the stimulus package? I, I was mistaken. It really is a great package. I'm very, very sorry. I mean, just imagine if we had taken the three, uh, three and three quarters trillion dollars and had a tax holiday in the U.S., no federal taxes at all for a year and three quarters. Can you imagine what would have happened to output employment and production? If you want production, reward production. It's not consumption that does it, it's production that does it. The wonderful Bev MacArthur. What a microphone coming, Bev. Thank you, John. Oh, sorry, Bev. A microphone sorry. from Darcy. Thank you, John. Beverly MacArthur. You know, given that politicians uh, raise taxes to spend, but in reality to buy a voter's vote with their own hard-earned money. Have you produced a Laffer curve on the competency and efficiency of government expenditure relative to the rate of expenditure? I was so, I'm so glad you asked that. I, I'm, I'm going to pay you a little bit later for that. Do you really want to solve the problem with government? Let, let me just try on this and see if it makes any sense to any of you. If you have two companies, A and B, they're identical companies, well, with, with one difference. Uh, company A, the officers and directors have very high salaries, paid a lot, they have no stock, they have no, no stock options. And company B, the officers and directors are paid a lot less, they own stock, and they have a lot of stock options. Which of those two companies would you prefer to invest in? Company B. When you look at politicians today, they don't have skin in the game. Now let me just take you through the U.S. Do you remember that Jimmy Stewart film, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington? imbued with the wonderfulness of making the world a better place. He goes to Washington, he works really hard. Interest rates come down, inflation rate come down, uh, unemployment rate goes down, the economy prospers, the enemies of America are pushed offshore, they go back home, and everything is wonderful. And What happens to that congressperson's salary? Nothing. 
Now his evil twin comes in. <laughs> and he ruins everything. He destroys things. The interest rate goes up. Inflation goes up. Babies are dying in the hospitals. Everything's horrible. The enemies are coming into there. What happens to that congressman's salary? Nothing. My view is really very simple. We should put all politicians on commission. <laughs> what I would do is I'd give every congressman in the United States, I'd give them $5,005 million shadow portfolio in the S&P 500. I'd allow them to keep all the capital gains tax-free and I'd hold them personally liable for all the capital losses. <laughs> they would never vote the way they vote now. What you've got to do is I have no problem with politicians making lots and lots of money as long as I do too. <laughs> and they've got to be made responsible and bear the consequences of their own policy, period. So the next real big agenda item, my view, is to bring incentive pay back into politicians and in this country, in this world. And I think that's the one that would ultimately solve the problem for all of us. John, do you have a view on... Well, I'm sure you do have a view on politicians spending other people's money. Well, well that's really quite uncanny because almost the first article I ever wrote for money um, back in the 60s was a proposal for the reform of the House of Lords. And I said, well, you've got to have a democratic system um, but you, for electing them, but it can't put them at, um, it can't make them a rival to the, uh, to the House of Commons. So the democratic system would be lot, by lot. There would be uh, the, the the national lottery uh, would decree every year that twelve or fourteen or twenty people had been elected to the House of Lords, and they would give them five million pounds, which would give them, as Dr. Laffer just pointed out, would give them an interest in low inflation, good conditions for investment, and all the all of the policies that lead to rewards for um, for the nation as a whole. That uh, I thought that was a good article, and it's just been confirmed by the expert. <laughs> so I have to tell you, it was rejected as absurd by the newspaper that I'd submitted to. But, but there we are. Um, I should have continued with that particular campaign. And uh, last question from uh, Raymond down here. All right. Uh, right, uh, yes. Uh, during the um, first uh, tax cuts of Reagan, uh, he couldn't get it through because of the um, Democratic House. Uh, he wanted the tax cuts backdated, the first 10% date. And so do you think there would have been a difference if the uh, GFC, uh, if they, instead of s deficit spending, they had backdated tax cuts instead? Whether that would have made any difference? I wish you hadn't asked that question. Yes, of course it would have. Uh, in fact, after the tax bill passed, the president called. He was very enthusiastic, very excited. Um, he could tell fairly quickly on the phone that I wasn't as enthusiastic as he thought I should have been. Uh, and he said, you're not going to pour cold water on this now, Arthur, are you? He said, no, sir, I'm really happy the bill passed. I'm really delighted. He said, are you disappointed it was only 25% instead of 30? I said, no, no. I was amazed you even got 25%. He said, what's the problem? I said, sir, you phased in the tax cuts. He said, well, what do you mean? I mean, you have all these, you just don't understand the politics. See, these guys just won't vote for a deficit right on the spot, so we phase it in, so we got the deficit under control and all that. I said, sir, can I ask you a question? He said, fine. What, what Arthur? And I said, sir, how much would you shop at a store? A week before that store has its well-announced discount sale. And his, sales was, his statement to me was, oh my God, how bad's it gonna be? <laughs> And I told him it's going to be a barn burner. And if you want to go back to Barron's, that's where I had the interview where I went through all this stuff about, it's amazing how tax cuts don't work until they take effect. <laughs> and then they work like mad. Our tax cut began on January 1st, 1983 because of the phase-in. And our recovery, our boom, started on January 1st, 1983. I mean, it was just amazing. That is exactly what, if we'd have predated it, which we wanted to do, we wanted to make 10% come in just when we came into office, 10% the first year, and 10% the second year with very little lag effect. That would have made a huge difference to the economy. We never would have had the 81-82 recession depression that we had, my view. Thank you, Dr. Laffer. Thank you, John.